Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexia Gangotena. I'm one of the co-chairs for the Yale Philanthropy Conference. On behalf of the conference organizers, we'd like to thank you all again for joining us and participating today. We'd also like to express our thanks again to our panelists and our speakers, our advisory board, and our sponsors, the Newman Owens Foundation, JM Kaplan Fund, and CCS Fundraising. Without you, today would not be possible. We hope the content today throughout uh, throughout all of the sessions has been inspiring and thought-provoking. Our goal is to provide a forum for debate and idea sharing for our sector. When leaders like yourselves meaningfully engage in the material, you enrich the discussion for all of the participants who attend. So thank you for participating. We hope you can attend next year and welcome any feedback that you may have for future conferences. We also hope that you can join us for the reception following the uh, keynote session and hope that you can also continue to speak with one another and learn from one another. Thank you. Thank you, Alexia. Uh, I'm Flannery Berg, and I'm also a co-chair for the Yale Philanthropy Conference. And I have the pleasure of introducing our afternoon keynote speaker, Aaron Dorfman. So when we decided on our conference theme of adaptive uh, philanthropy resilient sector and knew that we'd be really leaning into the sort of difficult issues of the moment today, I knew that Aaron would be the ideal speaker to call us to action at the end of a long, hard day of engaging in the material. Aaron Dorfman is the president and CEO of the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy is a research and advocacy organization that works to ensure that America's donors are responsive to the needs of those with the least wealth, opportunity, and power. He speaks and writes about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in philanthropy, the great benefits of funding advocacy and community organizing, and the need for greater transparency in our sector. And before joining NCRP, Aaron worked for more than a decade as a community organizer with two different national organizing networks. He holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Carleton College and a master's degree in philanthropic studies from the Lilly Family of School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. NCRP's work and Aaron's writing has personally really challenged and motivated me to consider how I might use my own career in philanthropy to fight for a more equitable future. And I'm sure you all will find him just as inspiring. So please join me in welcoming Aaron Dorfman to the stage. Oh, thank you. Well, good afternoon. Flannery, thank you for that really generous introduction. I didn't know I had personally touched you with my writing and, and work, so um, that's great to hear. Uh, and it's a real privilege to be with you all here today at the Yale Philanthropy Conference, and I'm especially glad um, to see that this year's conference is in memory of my good friend Paul Connolly. Um, those of you who knew him knew how amazingly special he was, and it was such a tragedy to lose him so suddenly last year. Um, so, less than um, 25 miles from here, a little more than five years ago, a man with a gun shot and killed 20 children and six adults at Sandy Hook Elementary. And last week, uh, 18 young people were shot dead in Broward County, Florida, the next county over from where my wife and I used to live and from where my wife was a high school teacher. Since the Sandy Hook massacre five years ago, there have been more than 1,600 mass shootings in the United States with nearly 2,000 people killed and 6,000 more wounded. The scourge of gun violence affects every American. So raise your hands if you're sick and tired of children being shot in our schools. My grandparents were immigrants to this country. On my father's side, uh, his parents came here to flee the anti-Jewish violence that was sweeping across Eastern Europe in the early 1900s. That's them there in the photo. On my mom's side, uh, her parents needed to escape the extreme economic hardship found on the rugged islands off the coast of Scotland. And everyone in this room, unless you're Native American, has an immigration story in their family history. 
Uh, some of your families came here looking for opportunity, while others were fleeing political oppression and violence. We are a nation of immigrants. So why are so many of our elected leaders all of a sudden demonizing immigrants, especially those who are various shades of black and brown? And why can't our elected officials agree to a solution for the dreamers when nearly 80% of our population thinks they should be allowed to stay? It's crazy, right? So raise your hand if you urgently want our society to figure out how to welcome and fully include immigrants, not demonize them. I'm in the right room, this is great. <laughs> For about 10 years uh, from when I was eight until I was 18, my mother, one of the first women ordained in the Presbyterian Church, served as the chaplain at the women's prison in Shakopee, Minnesota. And I used to go with her to work sometimes. And I met and enjoyed spending time with many of the inmates. I learned at an early age that our society doesn't do enough to prevent and end violence against women. A huge percentage of the women in that prison were there for murdering their abusive husbands and boyfriends. Our society failed them by not taking their abuse seriously and by not taking steps to prevent it. The truth is that women and girls in our society have had to live for far too long under a system that doesn't recognize their inherent worth and doesn't treat women as equals. And so it's particularly heartening to see the Me Too movement and the women's movement come to life uh, in response to this uh, very anti-woman administration that we have uh, in office right now. And I could talk for the whole hour about other important issues besides these three, like the need to reform our criminal justice system, where people of color are imprisoned at rates that are unconscionable, and where ex-felons never earn back the right to vote in some states, even after serving their time. And speaking of voting rights, we could do a whole day about the need to protect our democracy by fighting voter suppression, reigning in the influence of money in our political system, and putting an end to partisan gerrymandering. Or we could have a master class about the urgent need to combat climate change and protect our environment. I could talk for a whole hour about any of these important issues, but I won't. Uh, you're all here, we are all here, because we care passionately about these issues and many others, and we want to use philanthropy to make the world a better place. And if we're going to be successful in doing that, we have got to ask ourselves the right questions. These are challenging times that we are living in, and by asking ourselves the right questions, the hard questions, we can make a real difference with our philanthropy on the issues that truly matter. And so today I'm going to put forward five questions uh, that I think will help, uh, help us be effective in these challenging times. So the first question I want to encourage you to ask about your philanthropy is, am I dreaming big enough? Are we dreaming big enough? And so, you know, in his famous speech at the March on Washington, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did not come forward and say, I have a realistic plan with measurable objectives <laughs> and uh, I can have clear benchmarks and share, right? That's not what inspires us. Uh, he talked about his dream. And the truth is there is no limit to what philanthropy can accomplish in the world if we dream big enough and are willing to take the risks necessary to make those dreams happen. Now, some of you might be thinking that's a little ridiculous. Philanthropic dollars are just a drop in the bucket. The best we can hope to do is fund effective programs and improve as many lives as we can. Well, I think that kind of small ball thinking is horse pucky, and we need to abandon it if we want to truly transform and improve our nation and the world. So I'm going to tell a story about a couple of foundations that had those big dreams and how they changed the world. Think back 20 years ago, 1997, 1998, gas was $1.22 a gallon. Uh, the Lion King musical had just debuted on Broadway. It was the hot new thing. 
and of course that uh, unforgettable song Wannabe by the Spice Girls <laughs> made it to the top of the charts. Now did anyone in this room believe in 1997 that in less than 20 years marriage equality would be the law of the land? It didn't seem remotely possible. Full marriage equality for same-sex couples seemed very, very far off. But then in 2000, the leaders of the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund, a California-based philanthropy, began thinking about how the foundation could best support work to advance rights and dignity for gay people. And they began to dream big. And in, two, they, in 2001, they made a $2.5 million commitment to the Freedom to Marry campaign. And at the time, that was the largest gift ever made by a foundation in the history of the gay rights movement. And that investment got the ball rolling. And in 2003, recognizing that they couldn't possibly do this alone, the Haas Jr. Fund helped organize a collaborative of funders who could work on these issues, the Civil Marriage Collaborative, which included a handful of committed, like-minded funders from across the country. It took a big dream, visionary leadership, and trust to make this funder collaborative work. And working together for the next dozen years and in deep partnership with the movement organizations, they accomplished what was once unthinkable. And it wasn't always easy, right? Changing society is really hard. And even as the campaign secured state level wins and started racking up a number of them, they also had to deal with serious setbacks. But the funding partners stuck by each other and by their grantees, keeping their eyes on the prize and building momentum by winning an increasing number of these state level victories. And then on June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court ruled and made marriage equality the law of the land. And it was a great day and the culmination of a very long campaign in which funders and nonprofits worked together to make our society a little more fair and just. Now, I'm sure everyone in this room has a story about how this ruling has impacted your life. Um, for me, I got to attend the wedding of my sister uh, a couple of years ago in Minnesota. So I want to, uh, I want to ask you all to do a little exercise with me. Um, I want you to close your eyes and think about your dream. What is it that you want your philanthropy to make happen in the world? Uh, I'm serious now. I want you to close your eyes for just a minute, get a picture in your mind about what is your dream for your philanthropy. OK, you can open your eyes now. I'd love to hear from a few of you. I want to know what some of the dreams are in this room. We've got microphones uh, coming down the aisles. Who wants to share their dream about what their philanthropy might accomplish in the world? There we go. Uh, Betty Sugarman Weintraub uh, with Chifa, and um, the big dream has to do with workforce and workforce for all and lifting everyone up um, because everyone wants the dignity of having a job and, um, and making that a reality is something that philanthropy can play a role in and a big role because we can take the risks that um, government oftentimes cannot take the same kind of risk, but, um, but the partnerships that we work with, um, with philanthropy and government and nonprofits and uh, education can make those kinds of dreams a reality. Fantastic, thank you. Another dream. Here we go, over here. I'm Jameson Folk. I'm a UConn MPA student. Um, my dream is for a 100% voting uh, record in the United States. Wow. Uh, might as well shoot for the Ambitious. So. Yep. Imagine what would happen if everybody actually voted in every election. It's a great dream. Love it. In the back there, this will be our last one. My name is Howard Hill. 
my dream is to uh, not just close the uh, wealth gap for the black community, but to actually be on the opposite side of that, uh, that line, that wealth line for the black community. Fantastic. <laughs> Amazing dream. We got to stay in touch with those dreams if we're going to be effective with our philanthropy. It's what motivates us. It what's, it's what gives us the energy to do the sometimes, you know, 16-hour days that need to be done to drive change. There's powerful forces working against our dreams. So I encourage you all uh, to keep asking yourself that question. Am I dreaming big enough? Are we dreaming big enough? Um, Second question I want to encourage you to ask about your philanthropy is, are we doing enough to intentionally benefit and empower vulnerable and marginalized communities? Now, there's a moral reason to ask yourself this question, and there's also a pragmatic reason to do so. Uh, the moral argument is pretty obvious. Those who are fortunate enough uh, and have, uh, have privilege have an obligation to give back. Uh, Virtually every faith tradition preaches some sort of version of that same message. Um, the pragmatic argument is what I want to spend more time on today. And it's pretty simple. It's that it works. In fact, uh, with most ambitious philanthropic visions, you won't be able to succeed in accomplishing your goals if you don't intentionally benefit and empower marginalized communities. So first, let's talk about intentionally benefiting underserved communities. Let, let me use the Lumina Foundation as an example. Lumina Foundation is a national funder based in Indiana, which has an audacious goal of ensuring that 60% of Americans hold degrees, certificates, or other high-quality post-secondary credentials by 2025. So it's a universal goal, a big goal for the entire US population. Um, it's, it's a vision in which all people in our country are included. And, but they recognize that the barriers to getting degrees and post-secondary credentials are different for African Americans than for white people. Then they're aware that the challenges facing Latino households are unique. And so they make grants specifically designed to benefit different groups of people. And so for Lumina, making grants specifically designed to benefit various underserved communities is a practical question. They need to see progress in Latino communities, in African American communities, in Native communities, and in white communities if they want to realize this audacious goal that they have for all of America. And this principle is called targeted universalism. And if that's a new principle to you, you can learn more about it on the NCRP website or better yet, from Dr. John A. Powell, uh, who is the director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society at Berkeley. Um, the basic concept is that you need to use uh, targeted means to achieve universal goals. And too many foundations don't take this important step. They say, we're doing our grant making to benefit everybody. And then they wonder, why certain communities weren't actually helped with their grant making. Well, it's because they didn't plan for it. They weren't intentional about what do we need to do to actually reach the different communities that they were trying to benefit. So now let's talk a little bit about empowering underserved communities. First of all, let me be clear that a foundation can't really empower anyone. Um, but donors can give organizations money so that they can use it to empower themselves. Um, grants that help oppressed communities empower themselves are grants that they can use for community organizing, for advocacy or civic engagement work, grants that allow them to build power, win changes in policy, and improve systems. So a simple example of the a difference between a grant to benefit an underserved community and one to empower that community uh, comes from recent news reports. I'm sure you're all familiar with the dreamers, um, the young people whose undocumented parents brought them to the US when they were children. Um, and you've probably heard that Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, recently pledged to give $33 million for scholarships for the dreamers. Um, so a grant to United We Dream uh, for those scholarships for dreamers would get coded as being to benefit an underserved community 
but it wouldn't be coded as intended to empower that community uh, for the, that grant to get coded as an empowerment grant or a social justice grant, Bezos would have to provide general operating support to United We Dream that they could use for advocacy to change the laws or he would have to give a grant specifically for their advocacy and organizing efforts. And some dreamers might ask Mr. Bezos, what good is a scholarship going to do me if I'm being expelled from the country? because we haven't won this advocacy fight. So I, I hope he ends up realizing that and puts a few million more towards the advocacy efforts in addition to the great funding of the scholarships that he has pledged. So the leverage factor when funding advocacy, community organizing, and civic engagement is tremendous. Uh, government spending dwarfs philanthropic giving on every single issue imaginable. So take education, for example. Um, one of the most popular causes for foundations and individual donors to support. If you add up all the money going for education, uh, it's outnumbered 3,000 to one by government spending on education. Um, so uh, if you're gonna be successful, you've gotta influence policy and systems. Um, we did some research on the actual benefits for families and communities of foundation funding for advocacy and uh, organizing work. We were getting a lot of questions from uh, uh, staff who said, can you help me explain to our trustees why we should fund this stuff? The trustees just want to help people. Um, and, and I'm not able to explain to them how our grants to these rabble-rousing groups actually helps anyone. Uh, so we said we, we can do something about that. And we did uh, seven studies over three years in red states and blue states and urban areas and rural areas. And uh, we documented the tangible benefits to families and communities of foundation funding for organizing and advocacy and civic engagement. Um, $26 billion in benefits off of $230 million in spending by 110 different nonprofit groups all across the studies. And that comes out to a return on investment of 115 to one, um, a pretty impressive leverage factor. Um, another example would be the afford passage of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Atlantic Philanthropies, the California Endowment, and a few other foundations uh, robustly funded the grassroots advocacy uh, at the time that the Affordable Care Act was going through Congress. And many observers credit the nonprofit advocates with pushing that over the finish line. And now uh, millions of Americans are benefiting, and it's worth billions of dollars, uh, off of uh, a few dozen millions of dollars in advocacy funding by a few foundations. So, so if this leverage factor is so clear and if the pragmatic argument for prioritizing and benefiting and empowering underserved communities is, is so strong, you'd think that most foundations would be doing it, right? They're run by logical people, right? Um, not really the case. Um, we find that foundations still shy away from adopting these strategies, unfortunately. So uh, we regularly analyze data about foundation giving. Um, and our most recent report on this topic is called Pennies for Progress. And you see just a few of the findings up there. Uh, less than a third of all grant dollars given by the largest thousand or so US foundations is intentionally designed to benefit uh, communities who have been marginalized in our society. and. We're talking about low-income communities, women and girls, people with disabilities, immigrants, the elderly, communities of color, and other groups. It's a very expansive definition of underserved communities. Uh, and still, only about a, a third of all grant dollars has some intentionality around benefiting those groups. And 90% of large foundations in this data set, 90% uh, of them don't meet our benchmark for devoting at least half of their grant dollars to intentionally benefit underserved communities. Um, and uh, if you think about the empowerment piece of this question, only about 10% of all giving by large US foundations is meant for social justice and advocacy and civic engagement and community organizing work. Only 10%. Um, I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. And in our criteria for philanthropy at its best, we recommend benchmarks of 50% of grant dollars at least from any foundation to benefit uh, underserved communities and at least a quarter uh, for empowerment of those communities. Now, every foundation is different and there will be some cases where those numbers 
aren't right, some cases they're too low, some they're too high, but having some benchmarks has been a good starting point for a discussion uh, for a lot of funders. Um, another factor to take into consider consideration with all of this is the geographic spread of your grant making. We have huge inequity in giving by geography in the U.S. and the South, no surprise, is being starved for philanthropic dollars. So if you're doing good nonprofit work in the Acela Corridor, you're going to get a whole lot more money than if you're doing good work in the South. And that's leading to some really um, uh, harmful conditions. And so we've been doing this multi-year project to try to encourage more donors to invest in the South because we think our democracy depends on it. We've got we've to make the South strong. We've got to make sure that people of color in the South can fight back against these oppressive governors who are uh, trying to, you know, uh, uh, curtail their rights um, if we want to um, see our, our entire society move forward. Um, all right, so that's the, uh, that's the second question, and I just I want to take an audience poll. Uh, so when you think about your own philanthropy, if you're part of a foundation or a giving program, great, or you think about your own personal giving and philanthropy where you put your efforts. If you think about this question, I'd just love to get a, a yes or no show of hands. Yes, we're doing, and we're doing all we can to benefit and empower underserved communities, or no, nah, I think we could be doing better. We should be doing more. Who's for yes, we're doing all, all we can on this? One, all right, awesome. Uh, and, and who thinks they could be doing more to benefit and empower underserved communities? Okay. And some, yeah, I, I think that's like a lot of where the nation's uh, foundations and high net worth donors are today. Um, and I, it, it's good to push yourself and challenge yourself on those questions. Um, the third question I want us to wrestle with today is, um, is our privilege making us overly cautious? Now look, I'm a straight, white, cisgender man who has never been in poverty and who doesn't have a disability. I've got just about every form of privilege going for me uh, that I can. And, and society's given me uh, uh, tremendous advantages and I try to use that privilege to advance an agenda that will make our society more fair and just for everyone. And in many ways, every single person in this room has a certain amount of privilege. If you're white, you get the benefit of the doubt from the police. Not true for people of color. If you're a man and you're pushy, you get thought of as assertive and authoritative. If you're a woman and you're pushy, sometimes you're labeled a bitch. If you're not living with a disability, that's a huge advantage in our society. Um, so, but being privileged isn't always an advantage in philanthropy. Your privilege can create serious blind spots. It can make you unnecessarily cautious, and it can actually make it harder for you to achieve your goals. So your implicit bias, born of your privilege, might make you not hire the best program officer. It might make you miss out on someone who'd, who would be a great new board member for your foundation. It might make you invest in the proven, reliable organization that has good metrics, rather than in the smaller, scrappier group led by people of color that you decide, eh, I'm not sure if they really have the capacity to do this work. Uh, and the folks in the equity breakout session just before this were talking about that. Um, we see this all the time in our research at NCRP. Foundations aren't investing in the South or in rural communities or in communities of color because they don't think there is capacity there. But the truth is there's a ton of capacity. Um, but nonprofit capacity looks different in the South than it does in the Acela Corridor. Um, and our privilege and our bias doesn't let us see the full potential. Uh, now, the good news is you can uh, learn to compensate for your blind spots. You can take some intentional steps. Um, and some of the most effective foundations do this and do it successfully. Um, so they make sure to have a full commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. They maintain diversity at the staff and board level, knowing that diverse teams are actually stronger and make better decisions than non-diverse teams. 
And they work for full inclusion so that people on their staff and board don't have to hide who they are. They can bring their whole selves to the jobs at hand. And they make sure the foundation is focused on equity as a North Star for their grant making and other practices. Um, you know, and they audit themselves to make sure they're living up to their aspirations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, diversity is a, a, on staff or board of a grant making organization is a great way to protect against those blind spots that privilege brings with it. Um, but you have to actually share power with people who are different from you. This can't be about tokenism. Uh, it won't work and it'll be an extremely frustrating experience for everybody involved. Um, another way to uh, guard against the blind spots of privilege is to do an analysis of your giving. Are you satisfied with the amount you're giving to organizations led by people of color? You know, sometimes people make these technocratic decisions. They think they're being, uh, running a meritocracy and that the best groups are going to get the money. Well, do an audit of that. Look at, look, go back and look. Oh my gosh, we're only funding groups led by white people. Uh, you know, something's really wrong there. You're not having a meritocracy if that's what's happening. And the only way you know is if you actually analyze your giving and, and look at the numbers. You know, philanthropic organizations, we have this immense freedom. Foundations are really sort of lightly regulated institutions, but we don't use it. We don't use that freedom that we have uh, to take the risks and to really step out there and, and drive an agenda. And it's, uh, I think it's our privilege that holds us back from doing that. There's not that sense of urgency or need to take those risks. And so our default, because of our privilege, makes us overly cautious. And so the only way to get around that is to be thoughtful and intentional and systematic about interrogating your own aspirations and whether you're living up to them uh, in your grant making and other practices. Fourth question I want to encourage us to uh, ask about our philanthropy is, are we giving in ways that promote the health, growth, and effectiveness of our grantee partners and of those that they serve? Um, there's two essential things your grantees uh, uh, must have if they're going to maximize their effectiveness and their impact. They've got to have sufficient unrestricted revenue, and they have to have long-term commitments. Um, and Andrea talked about some of this uh, this morning. Um, Unrestricted general operating support allows grantees the flexibility to adapt to, uh, to changing circumstances and to invest in their own capacity. And multi-year funding allows them to plan and to attract and retain the best staff people. Think about it. If you're uh, thinking of joining an organization and they've got a balance sheet that's you know, really tiny, if you're the best and the brightest in your field, you might not take that job. Um, but if the funders of that group had given them some multi-year grants and the balance sheet was a little more healthy, um, they're going to be able to attract some better staff along the way. Um, so we have benchmarks that we recommend for this as well. We recommend at least half of your grant dollars for foundations be given in the form of general operating support and also at least half in the form of multi-year grants, multi-year funding. I talked to a foundation uh, just yesterday that is uh, finally uh, they do about $25 million in giving a year. I was down in New York yesterday, and he finally said, we've finally got a plan to transition from single-year grants to true multi-year grants. Every year they kept saying, we know we should do it, we know we should do it, but they didn't have the room. They finally made a plan to make that transition happen. So we've got these benchmarks, half of your grant dollars as general operating support, half for multi-year funding. Um, uh, just get a show of hands on this one. Who, who thinks they, uh, they meet the general operating support benchmarks with any uh, giving that they're a part of. Couple here, all right, good. And what about multi-year funding? Anybody doing multi-year uh, grants in the room? Awesome, great, great, good, all right. Um, a long way to go, and I know not everybody here is uh, associated with a, a grant-making organization that could answer that question, but um, good to see that some of you are doing it, and I challenge those of you who aren't to um, see how you can improve on those metrics because it makes a real difference to your grantee partners. Um, my friends over at GEO, the Grant Makers for Effective Organizations, put out a report periodically that looks at these issues. Uh, it's called, Is Grant Making Getting Smarter? Um, and when I look at the data, I, you got to answer, I'm not sure that it really is. 
uh, we repeat a lot of the same mistakes. The, the things that matter, if you look at the trend lines, it's not getting a whole lot better. Uh, and the only way it's going to change, it changes at certain institutions, and it changes when somebody decides that they want to be the one who drives the change and makes it happen. So I hope all of you in this room can be that person at any organizations that you have influence with. Um, all right. So uh, fifth question I want to ask ourselves, uh, are we wielding our power and all the tools at our disposal to build the world we envision? Good philanthropy is about more than just making grants. Um, we have to wield our power too. Yes, the grants are essential. Your nonprofits will, um, I mean, that's the thing they need more from you than anything else. They need the money. Um, but, uh, but too many funders rely only on their grants to achieve impact, and they miss an opportunity to leverage some other tools at their disposal to advance their mission uh, and values and goals. Um, in 2014, there was a great speech by Ambassador James Joseph, who addressed community foundations at the Council on Foundations Community Foundations Conference uh, on the five types of philanthropic capital. And he urged them to move from being a grant maker to being a social enterprise that strategically deploys not just financial capital, but social, moral, intellectual, and reputational capital as well. Um, and, and the non-financial capital uh, represents institutional and individual power that can be effectively used to influence others in order to achieve equitable long-term change. Um, yet the idea of wielding power and influence can be difficult for some foundations that like to pride themselves on being a neutral convener. Um, you know, there's this uh, quote by um, Bishop Desmond Tutu that, um, uh, if an elephant is standing on the tail of a mouse uh, and you tell the mouse that you're a neutral convener, um, he's not going to appreciate that very much. Uh, and, and I think it makes far more of a difference when foundations, in fact, clearly, and high net worth donors, take a side, take a stand. Stand for communities that you are trying to advance. The neutrality uh, is really overrated as uh, an asset that foundations have. Um, exercising the power of the bully pulpit um, is, is so important. And you know, some people conflate that with being partisan uh, or with being dictatorial. That, you don't have to do it that way. Um, philanthropic power can and should be wielded for good if done in thoughtful ways that acknowledge your institutional and personal privilege and align with the goals and strategies of the communities you are trying uh, to benefit. And so uh, there's many ways foundations can exercise this kind of public leadership and wield their power. Um, and I'm just going to quickly go through five of them. Um, so you can convene grantees and other community stakeholders. Take, say that after a nat natural disaster, a foundation might take the lead or convene a group to make sure that the poor aren't left out of the recovery planning process. Uh, some foundations uh, did this somewhat successful, su uh, successfully, somewhat not, in New Orleans after Katrina. Um, or after a, a, a tragedy or a terrorist attack, like the mass shooting at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. Um, a foundation might con convene stakeholders to make a plan that results in a great new philanthropy like the Contigo Fund. Um, so uh, one, that's one way you can do it. You can organize and collaborate with your philanthropic peers who share common concerns. I mentioned earlier the Civil Marriage Collaborative, which helped drive the campaign for marriage equality. Another example is Funders for Justice, a national network of funders increasing resources to grassroots organizations addressing the intersection of racial justice, gender justice, community safety, and policing. You can use your position in the community and your foundation's reputation to bring visibility to critical issues and amplify the voices of the most marginalized. Minneapolis Foundation did this right after uh, the last presidential election by hosting Sambusa Sunday and sending a clear message that the foundation and the broader community was going to stand by the Somali immigrant community uh, that was being targeted 
with a lot of hatred uh, at that time. Another way you can uh, advance the mission without grants is mission investing, right? Use the power of your investments to advance your values and your goals. Um, and finally, uh, especially living donor foundations have the flexibility to do this. You can complement your C3 giving with uh, some C4 giving, some direct political spending uh, to advance the goals, understanding the complexity of how change really happens in society. So Michael Bloomberg does this particularly well with his efforts to reduce gun violence. Um, C3 grants to every town for gun safety, uh, C4 funding not through his foundation, also to that same organization for their C4 arm, and then direct political contributions to candidates that are willing to stand up for gun control. George Soros does this kind of weaving of the C3, C4, and political giving uh, very effectively as well. So um, we're living in, in challenging times, and philanthropy can really make a difference. I've offered you five questions today that I think are essential. If we're going to build a society where fairness and justice are the norm, not the exception, um, and I look forward to taking some questions and having some dialogue now. Thank you. Got one down here. Uh, hi. So there are a number of us in the room who are students of some kind, undergraduate, graduate, here, other uh, area schools. And I guess I would love to hear what those of us, you know, poised to enter the field uh, can do to help advance this kind of philanthropy. Great question. Um, people at all levels of an organization can have a tremendous difference and make a tremendous impact on what issues that organization is forced to wrestle with. And so I would say ask hard questions, right? As you enter organizations, even if you're not the one in charge, you can say, hey, what about this? And I read this thing. And you, know, you can be the one that sort of forces organizations that are slow to change um, to wrestle with some of these important issues. Um, that's how. Change happens at every organization that I've ever seen it happen. Like somebody on the inside is the one who raises, you know, raises the hard questions. You got to strike that balance from pushing too hard so you get fired. Um, but you know, you can always find another job. Like, I mean, <laughs> really, what are we here on this earth for, right? If you're not going to push for and stand up for the stuff that you care about in the world, I mean, come on. So. Um, if it's the kind of place that would fire you for raising those kinds of issues, maybe it's not the place where your energies uh, need, to be, uh, need to be placed. But I would just say, yeah, raise the issues, push some, be patient, but you know, try to make sure that the leaders in that organization are, are making, making progress. Yeah, over here. Hi, um, I'm Angelica Durrell from the Intake Music Organization in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, I want to ask, what kind of recommendations do you have for uh, women of color in a nonprofit sector looking to build cultural equity through education and, and music? How could we approach our current funders or our foundation partners or prospects to invest in cultural equity in, in, a, in a positive way, in a non um, exigence way, or what should we show them in terms of data, stories, or the future of the demographic lands landscape? Was that like a setup question? Because we did a report on this. That's a great question. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the exact name of it. Um, Holly Sidford wrote it for us. It was about five years ago. Fusing Art, Culture, and Social Change is the title of it. It's on our website. And it's exactly from that sort of positive frame, um, encouraging and pushing arts and culture funders 
to move beyond funding of the traditional Western European canon organizations and to fund arts organizations led by people of color and presenting different kinds of arts approaches. So it goes, puts forward a really accessible uh, way to get into the, those issues with funders who are more used to just funding traditional um, uh, arts and culture organizations. Um, that's one thing. Another is don't do it alone, right? Get together with others and talk to, if there's a few big funders in your community of the arts and they need to uh, be sort of um, uh, presented with a new opportunity, maybe you all you know, go together and have that conversation uh, together so it's not just one uh, person or one organization raising the issue. Those are some of the thoughts that I have. Okay, great. Uh, we got several over on this side. Hi, I'm Mary Amalahi from the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut. How do we counter the influence and impact of dark money? Yeah, I mean that's it's a really big that's a really big uh, challenge and problem. Um, and I think what we're seeing in the special elections and the off-cycle elections that have been happening is that uh, money isn't the only thing that that matters, right? People are, who are running great races and exciting the population, uh, they're winning. And no matter how much money the other side is throwing at it. I think we saw that in the presidential race as well. Uh, uh, the Clinton campaign far outspent um, the Trump campaign, and yet we didn't get that result that one would expect. So I think money plays an important role, but I don't think that it's, um, the determinant factor. Um, that's a very unsatisfying answer, uh, and I know that, but I don't have a better one for you. Sorry. Hi there. Um, I'm a student here and one of the conference organizers, and I used to work in board governance at a nonprofit. And um, I hope this isn't too granular of a question, but um, in implementing a change agenda um, out of philanthropy, just like their nonprofits that they fund, they also have boards in many cases unless there's a living donor um, who might be able to make executive decisions. So um, I can imagine that uh, a staff being very progressive and very energized but encountering a, uh, a big slowdown or a big stumbling block and trying to also carry their board with them in transforming their agenda for their funding or philanthropy. And so um, what examples have you seen of board engagement in being able to carry through a very progressive, um, ambitious, philanthropic agenda? Yeah, uh, great question. And uh, the most effective thing that I see that moves boards along is um, relationships and experiences. Um, so if you're staffing a philanthropy and you want that board to like understand the struggle a little more, like get them out of the boardroom and into the community and meeting with real leaders who are tackling uh, real issues, and they will get excited by what they see. Um, and, and we've seen that work in a lot of ways. Um, Colorado, they couldn't get uh, the big foundations to fund in rural communities at all. So they said, all right. We're just going to take trustees and staff of all the big foundations out to the rural communities. We're going to organize a funder tour. And they went out and they met people and they formed relationships. And sure enough, the dollars flowed after it. Um, same thing with um, getting folks to move from a service delivery mindset to an advocacy and systems change mindset. Let them meet some of the activists who are well rooted in that community and who make a very persuasive case for what they're doing. Um, that that goes, uh, goes a long way. And changing the composition of the boards is an ultimate goal as well, right? Um, we recommend that uh, foundation boards include at least five people and a diversity of perspectives among them. Every family foundation board that I talk to, I encourage adding non-family members to the board. Um, people have, uh, it, it makes your philanthropy better and smarter to have a range of perspectives represented with real decision-making power on the board huge weakness of the Gates Foundation. You know, they, they formed advisory committees to say we're 
you know, getting input from the best. It's a good, it's a, it's a ni nice step, but, um, you know, you've still got just the family trustees plus Warren. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a real weakness. That power sharing at the board level is, uh, is a really great next step. And most of the families who've done it, they, they say it makes their philanthropy more effective and more fulfilling. So, great. What are the changes that you're seeing in the philanthropic sector that get you the most excited right now? Mm. Some of the... Um, a couple of things. So leadership of people of color at all levels is really taking off and is very exciting in the philanthropic sector. We're seeing more CEOs of color, especially of large foundations, than we've ever seen before. That's very exciting to me. And then you've sort of got the next tier down. Who was in that equity session? Oh my God, that was so great. Um, so uh, so I think the I think the leadership of people of color in our sector is the most exciting thing that I'm, uh, that I'm seeing. Yeah. We got one way in the back, back there. Hi, my name is Neela. I was just at an event, uh, a Yale event actually, featuring Elizabeth Alexander in, the, in New York City. It was a diversity, equity, and inclusion event. And one of the things that she talked about was that the word diversity kind of shortchanges or really hamstrings, I should say, our imagination around what's possible. And so I would be curious to hear your response to that and what are other ways you might um, open up that conversation, which often tends to close spaces, close spaces. Do you know what I mean? Like it t tends to close people, shut people down, and close the space rather than opening it up. Did she have suggestions at this event that was focused on that? Um, she used lo lots of other types of language. Um, so I'm trying to think of some. She she has very beautiful language. So it was, it was distracting. I wasn't taking notes, but I um, I found you know she, her her training is in poetry, and so I think I mean that's one of the thing, one of her identities, and I think um, she was rooting it more in a human experience. But in some ways, I think because she was speaking from that vantage point, we were more um, like we were more. Um, accepting of what she had to say versus a practitioner who I think when when a practitioner in the field speaks of diversity and equity it, it has a different kind of effect than when an artist does it yeah interesting well yeah. certainly I agree that artists help sort of break through new ways of thinking on uh, a lot of things so encourage that in as a way to way to sort of break through established mindsets um, uh, you know I, I talk with folks about um, helping us see the problems we're trying to solve from a bunch of different angles. And maybe we should find out, you know, listen to people who are really affected directly by this issue and see what they think and get those perspectives. Um, uh, something about seeing problems from a lot of different angles certainly doesn't put people off, makes intuitive sense, um, and is a way to, so who would, who would view this problem differently than we would? Who could we go talk to? Um, one example. Great. Any others? Flannery. I guess um, a question I have is what do you say to the organization resistant to this that says this just isn't our issue area. I think particularly on things, not so much on the underserved community side, but it could be, but I think especially the funding of advocacy and community organizing, um, to face that re resistance in specifically around this isn't our focus. Yeah, I mean, we hear it a lot. Um, what I always try to do is whatever their focus is, Get, get serious with them and find out if they're serious about getting results on the issue that they care about. I mean, if you are a funder who uh, you know, says, oh, we care about the homeless in our community, like, and you're funding 
only the shelters that, you know, important, right? Give people shelter, but how are we going to really solve this problem? And uh, you just drill down on the funding streams and all of the things that feed into the issues. And anyone who's being honest with themselves realizes they have to uh, somehow be connected to policy and advocacy work on almost every single issue um, that exists out there, from environment to um, education, health, you know, all of those. So it's about really drilling down and understanding, well, what do they actually care about? And then sort of helping them or forcing them to be a little bit more rigorous about what's it going to take to actually achieve what you want to achieve in the world. Um, we just want to help people isn't a serious like foundation mission statement, right? So if that's what they want to do, it's, you know, that's about how it makes them feel to help people. It's not about actually solving problems in the community and making it a better place. So I just try to encourage people to get more specific about what they want to see happen and then what it's going to take to get there. Um, and then it gets really hard to ignore uh, the, the need for um, advocacy as a portion of the um, approach and response of that foundation. Great. Well, this, is, uh, this has been great. I really uh, appreciated the chance to be with you all today. And I'll be, uh, I'll be at the reception uh, that follows. Happy to chat more there with some of you. Um, but um, before we go, I just want us to reflect a little bit on the day and make some commitments. Because, um, uh, you know, I'm an, I was an organizer for 15 years before I took this job, so I never like to leave and not have people make commitments. Um, you know, these are, uh, these are urgent times that we're living in. And I don't think it's hyperbole to say that the future of our democracy and the planet are at stake. And there really is no time to waste. And we must never forget that there is, there's no limit to what we can accomplish with good philanthropy. And it's going to take everybody in this room doing their part to ensure that philanthropy plays a meaningful role in building a more fair, just, and democratic society. Um, so I, I want to encourage, I want to see who in this room is uh, serious about that and wants to be part of that journey. So, so stand up if you're going to start a serious conversation uh, about mission investing uh, or about increasing general operating support or multi-year grants in some of the circles that you're involved in. Anybody going to start that kind of conversation? All right, there's one, two, good, all right, stay standing. Uh, now, uh, if you're willing to have that courageous conversation about white privilege and racial equity in some of the groups that you're a part of. Stand up. Wow, all right, good, good. Uh, what about if you're gonna personally donate or advocate for more money from a foundation you're a part of to go for move, social movements and advocacy and social justice and organizing? Anybody gonna do that? All right, good. Almost everyone is standing. This is fantastic. The room is full of fellow travelers that you can work with to make our society better. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you today, and I look forward to the reception. Thank you.